Today we're taking a longer look at the world of lithops, or living stones. We'll look at different species and where they come from. We'll look at breeding. We'll look at some of the problems that you might have with your lithops. And at the end of the video, we've added some bonus material on other MSMs. And while we're doing all of this, we'll take a good look at the wide collection of lithops that James Lucas from Succulents Australia has collected over the years. Let's take a look. Okay, come in, come in. This is our growing area. We've got a whole range of plants here. And with the lithops, now, you've been collecting them for a while. Yeah, look, I probably started about 10 years ago with a few and liked them. But it, I'll be honest, it took me a little while to learn how to grow them. Um, and it's only in the last four or five years I've started to understand a little bit more. And I'll talk about later how I did it. But uh, this is mainly Echeveras all through here. But we're going to the Lithop Arium. Now this is a little bit of a different area, different sort of yep. different treatment to Lithops to some yeah. of the other succulents. Yeah, this house has got a separate watering system and we water it differently. This is it here, down here, John. Okay. And we call this like a Mesem house. They're all basically plants from South Africa. And their watering requirements are quite different to Echeveras, which is one of the main things we grow here. Um, there's a lot of different types. Many, so, many varieties. I have collected seed from probably five or six different sources over the years. And uh, this is actually what I've collected here. I've put them aside. You've got some really good red ones uh, down here. That's collection from Japan. And again, yeah, this is another African plant. These grow with lithops. So these are so, mesems as well? No, no, no. This is and Andromiscus. So this grows in the same area. So that's why that happens to be in this house. Okay. And there's a collection of rare ones there. But these are ones that I've pulled aside as I consider them exceptional specimens. They're particularly good color and things like that. But we can go through a few different things. So, so, so with, with the lithops, um, we notice here, and you'll see it on the close-ups that we've got, that there's a coal number, C-O-L. Oh yeah, okay then. Look, lithops is a fairly large group and it's a very complicated group actually. What it has is about 35 plus species and uh, generally about 125, 130 forms. But there's actually more forms than that because Cole, he was a collector and a specialist in naming and growing a lot of these plants for many, many years. And he's, he's considered the authority on Lithops. He went all over South Africa seeking them out and this coal number actually represents an area. An area, they came from a specific area and they are a form of say Gesenae. Right, that's Lithops Gesenae. Now you might find that Gesenae actually grows in several areas and over the years they've deviated by not being able to touch each other, you know, geographically and they're so far apart that they've branched out and matched the rocks in their area and things like that. These are commonly called like jewels of the desert. You know, like look at the colour here. This will match the rocks where this came from. So with Caris Montana, there are lots of different sort of forms of that one. Oh yeah, quite a few. And the same with all of oh, the different of varieties. Them, as, as Leslie Eye is huge. There's a massive variation of these. And this is over the years, like people have collected, oh, a rare green form. And they've collected the seed of these rare forms and got them over here. Now, Otzeriana is one species, but I have about five or six different types of them. And here you've got one. This is like a bit of line breeding here. This is Lateritia. This is a select colour of Caris Montana. Okay, so do lithops actually change colour during the year? Well, they do a little bit, yeah. As the year goes on, these colours are going to fade. And you might notice inside here, the new leaves coming through, this is like, um, it, this splitting at this point, they either make two plants or they get bigger leaves. These are paler, that's richer colour. And you see in, in here, really quite dark compared to outside. But these have been selected by me from hundreds of seedlings 
you know, to have particularly good markings or line work on them and or really bright, vivid colours. And we're looking at a few of the, the close-ups of these as well. Yep. And you can see from these that the variation is enormous, really. Oh, it's huge, yeah. It's, it's massive. And, it's particularly, and it gets more particularly so when, you know, a hill 50 kilometres away has the same species, but they've never touched each other for years. Uh, and with lithops, you can grow them from seed? Oh, these are mainly grown from seed. If you get a big old clump, you can divide them, but really, you don't want to destroy an old clump. But if you want to get exactly the same plant? That's how you do it. Only way to do it. So that's really slow then. If you've got something super special. Incredibly slow way of doing it. It really is. They only like double up every year, maybe. Maybe, not necessarily. But these are, you know, this is a collection I got from Mesa. Um, so this is Mesa Gardens, yeah, in, the, Mesa Gardens in the United in States? Yep, and uh, this is one collection I've got off them. And these are really basic species. You can see here, like, this, this will be a variation. This will be, um, oh, that's 1709. Now, that's another collector other than Cole. But that'll be his selection. So in the collections of them, like, Cole has 405 notable areas that he's collected where they're all variable and different but there are half a dozen other collectors which have also contributed to the lithop collection now that's an interesting one there that is but it's uh yeah rushiorum rushiorum yeah rushiorum is that one around much or no it is not no that's not around much at all so that that's one of the rarer ones yeah it is and like here's another rare one here werneri i reckon that's a bit on the rare side Otsriana here is not r very often seen. This has got like, teeth marks around the edges of it, and there's a rare red form of that, which I'll show you later. Here's a good one of seeing the new rich colours coming out, where it's faded and the rich colours are coming out. So there are other collectors as well. I mean, Cole's probably the most famous, but there are other people who have contributed to yep. the growth of lithops. And yeah, I, there are. This I guess... Like De Boer is one. Uh, he's one collector. Off the top of my head, I can't think of, you know, too many more. I'd have to really look them up. But there's probably five or six collectors that have really contributed to various different lithops. So Cole doesn't own them all. You know, there are a few others have contributed. And then you've got the people who've been breeding them, like Shimada in yep, Japan. that's right. And he's... Famous. He's, he's the master of breeding. He so really is. He, he is specialised in line breeding. So he'll, he'll get something like this one here, and he'll get it with really clear markings and you know, big zigzags in here. And his selections or variations, uh, because of line breeding, they just perfect that line of marks around there. You can see that the marks on this one are more raised. Uh, there's quite good delineation in them whereas this one here not so spectacular so you breathe them this is a brown version of a greener one and so you do have a brown version a green version then we do have another one called aquamarine and then you've got another one which is a red one and it's different yet again so even in that one species you got four or five selections and with the lithops although they're from South Africa and Namibia it's different sort of areas? Definitely. When you get up near Namibia, you have less summer rain. It's sort of, they more get fogs over summer and they really do like a dry. Then lithops move right across the higher part of South Africa, east, and you have another water zone where it's slightly tropical and they do get a little bit of summer water as well. So they're quite variable. But we keep our stuff pretty dry here. This is a select group of seedlings from a Chinese gentleman and he has worked with Shimada's plants and or done his own improvements. And you can see the really striking colours, like look how bright, that's Fred's redhead there, um, green soapstone. So these are all rarer selections and he's working on improving them. You know, look, look at Julie here. Now Julie is never like that in nature. Look at the colours and the way it works. Another Julie, Julie Purper, a purple Julie. 
right? Fulleri. This is Julie Fulleri. So you can sort of see it's one species, but entirely different. That's a sea collection there. That would be from um, coal again. So, and what we've done is we've potted up a lot of these ones because these are all specials and we've moved them into one single plant in a two inch pot. There's one over there. See, it's just called Top Red, but that's Caras Montana. That's Caras Montana, but they just call it Top Red. And you can see how really red it is, even as a baby seedling. Now, the seedlings we we're just looking at, these are the bigger ones that we've moved on. And, you know, like we just saw uh, Top Red. Well, this is another more top red. And you see, consistently a really good colour, really bright red. And people do like reds. Greens are considered a bit rarer. And we have a lot of greens in here. So this is a worked group of seedlings or seed producers, seed produced by a specialist. There's Fred's redhead again. So that's a deeper red. Very deep red beautifully marked and the reds are very desirable people really like them and one of the first hybrids to come out um, was originally called Bacchus I believe but it was done by Mr Sato and uh, it's often called Sato's Violet that's these two here so it was a color that doesn't really happen in nature with them and this was a result of uh, crossing with Optica rubra which is a rare form in South Africa and it gave us this hybrid. So that is a genuine hybrid. Not all of them are, they often select. Now th these are Mr. Shimada's babies. This is the result of 40 years of line breeding. Now look at that definition of, you know, the marks around here, flat green top, beautifully marked. Here's another one here. I reckon these are really beautiful, those. Harley, gray and black. And Shimada, because they've been line bred, he's actually, um, how to say he's perfected them even better here's this here's another collector here this is uh, De Boer right now that's a really improved form and it's called Venteri so it's a quite a different form of that and with each species well hang on here's a good one here Otsuriana look at it that'll be the green form here that's a green and, form of Otsuriana yeah, yeah. Then this is supposed to be really big and toothy, this particular selection. So it's C350 Otsuriana. Yeah, and you can see C350 again, brown and green. Right. And, and down here we have Sesky Granat. Now that is another Otsuriana. That's the red form, the rare red form of it. And unfortunately I only have one of these, so I can't breed it yet. So up here we can see we've got some that are opening up and starting to split. Yeah, but look at this red here, isn't it superb? Yes, no, variety, you know, but the red form of it. And look at the colour differences in here between the new leaf and the old leaf. So this is when they change colour, when, when they're yeah. putting on the new leaf. Yep, that's but right. And as they come out, the summer will then fade them down. You know, look at the definition of the markings in this one here. And that one's... Uh, Reticulate. Right. Yeah, Julie. right. And you saw Julie over there. Yep. Entirely different plant. Now, this is another version of top red. Top red, I reckon it's a bit confusing because some have flat red tops, some have nice defined red lines in them. And I think a bit of work needs to be done sorting these ones out. And look at the markings on that. That's another Julie. Four eye. Okay. So there's a heck of a lot of variation. Huge. What's the rarest one you've got? I reckon it is. Let me find it. It is here. Ah, here we are. Anyway, this one is the weirdest. This is a, uh, a genuine mystery. They reckon it's a lithop, and somebody collected it years and years ago, but it's never been found in the wild. And it has been retained. Steinek Yana. Okay. So it's a mystery lithop, the mystery rarest, lithop. Rare, so. rarest, rarest of them all? Yeah, I think it might be. And it took me a long time to get, get, get a couple of plants, and I don't know anyone else that's got one. Not in Australia, anyway. Lithops are mesems. Yep. We've got other mesems? Oh, yeah, many. Um, let's have a look some. Now, these look like lithops, but they're not. Yeah. Argeodermas. Okay. Antirhinums. 
you've got Alienopsis, Alienopsis, and on down there. And what we've done here is, as young seedlings, these were very small, we've actually planted five in a pot, and later we'll either, we'll either sell a bare rooted or we move them up. So but these are what, Delianthi Pearsii? Yep. Okay. And this one's a, like Alienopsis Shunzai. That's beautiful. That really like, so see, we've got a few seed pods on here. And this one here, Alienopsis or Petii, is yeah. it? And here, Didymotus. <laughs> that's, a, that's a dead good name. And what it is, is Mesems, they all have a very similar type of flower. So they have like a daisy that's close down to the plant. And all of these plants, are, a lot of the flowers are quite frail. Now there's another one that's a really large one, looks like a giant lithop with split rock sort of thing. Yeah, Plesopilus. These are the Plesopilus. Yep, and this is a very well known mesem. And this is the rare red version of Plesopilus nelly. Okay. And the green one over here, and you see, you see the flowers. Um, we've grown these up a bit so they've got a, you know, these are pollinated, so we want a bit of seed on these. And you see, occasionally, if they're really healthy, they get a second flower. So you've hand pollinated those? Yeah, look, look at the size of them. See, that's a flower bud. Now, these are lovely because they come out after two o'clock. They run gentlemen's hours. And this is a much fatter one. This one's been pollinated, and you feel it's quite firm and big. So we wait till these dry out. Look, look at the size of that one. See, he's been pollinated here. Look at the size of that one. He's big, big as, bigger than my fingernail even. With the Plues at Palace, how many forms are there? I reckon there's about five or six. Because this is a species. this is a different one. Yeah, there's a couple of different species here. You have Nelly. Yeah, we've got another little. There's Bolzai. This is a really big leaf one. And there's another small one over the other side there. Um, we have about four. This is Otsuriana, but this one is Aquamarine. And you can sort of see there's better selections than others, but there's a really good dark colour there with bright green teeth on it. Okay, so these have been... That's a variety. It's That's a variety. a variety that people bought on, or line bred. Okay, which is a lot different. To the ordinary one, C350. This is Caras Montana. Which is the parent of top red and several other red forms of it. But here's something really interesting. Look at this one. This occasionally happens. You get three. Very rare. I've only ever seen that a few times. But some amazing colours happening oh, in this lot here. Yeah, and this is where you can do your selection. So the top red, the Japanese version of top red is bright red lines, like this one here. Bright red lines clearly defined, whereas some people reckon it's a really big dark red top on it. And I've seen them where you get like just a pure red top on it with a grey line around the edge through to lines. So they're a... really quite variable, nor an A. That was named after Cole's wife, Maureen. Green lithops are becoming increasingly popular. Yeah, what what have we got here? Okay, this is fulviceps. This is a green variation of the normal fulviceps. And then down here, you've got full of green. And that is a selected form that was found in the wild and by line breeding up and keep going, they've actually kept got it now as a green version of fuller eye. This is Optica rubra. Now Optica is normally a green form found in a really really dry area but someone quite a few years ago occasionally a red one pops out and this one has been responsible for quite a few hybrids. You know they've been able to mix it with some other ones and you generally find the white flowered ones do not mix with yellow flowered ones. Lithops are have two sort of distinct groups where there's you know mostly yellow or mostly white flowers and they two don't really mix and over here actually John that's interesting see how these are a bit shriveled and they're a bit soft yep look, look, look at that now they're really ready for water okay so a if... little bit of water not a lot because they're splitting at this time of the year and when they're starting to split you really need the plant to absorb all of these old leaves off they dehydrate back into the plant and the new leaves take up that moisture and grow out and then you start watering. But these ones here that are starting to shrivel a bit? They probably should get a little bit of water 
because they are looking a bit dry. But you don't want to give them too much because otherwise if you give them too much, they don't split properly. So when we talk about elongation with mesems and lithops, this is one here. What and causes this? Well, look, you can have two factors. Not enough light or it's you know, too pale or too much water at the wrong time. And that's really quite an important thing. But you can see several stages. You can see where the leaves have been well shriveled up and shrunken down on the sides there. You can see an old flower here, and you can see a new seed pod developed here. But it is being stretched. And it's once that's done, you've almost ruined the plant. It never really comes back out again. You might be able to do it through you know, water starvation, but I have not really seen it yet. And it is difficult if you've got one that gets watered at the wrong times. So we need to avoid overwatering, otherwise... Particularly in the wrong season. Yeah. You know, overwatering in the, in the real growing part where the splitty is not a good idea. Actually, John, that's an example of one that's not dehydrated properly. This one is having difficulty shedding its skin, and it's actually beginning to strangle it a little bit. Uh, you really must dry them out so the skin shrinks away and is shriveled, like that one there, and he'll peel out there and the new ones come out. But this one's having a bit of difficulty, which often means like too much water at the wrong time. And it's hard to keep them all the same, but theory, you can see here, the leaves are shriveled nicely, the new one's popping out, that's good. This one is having trouble. Here, you, there's a bit of burning on this one. Yeah, there's, it probably had a, just a bit too much sun in the early splitting period, and there's a little bit of damage on the windows. We call these windows here and because the light goes through them and they photosynthesize inside. So you do need to be careful, they're not out in full blazing sun. Well, all they have to be used to it. You, you know what I mean? They've got to be adapted to it and to, to get in there and do that. So you don't want to take them from indoors and put them out in Straight the sun? Straight out in the hot blasting sun. No, you don't want to do Otherwise that. Otherwise you're going to get a bit but of leaf burn. can take a lot of sun. You can see yourself, this house is quite bright. We will put a cover on here later in summer. So, so this one here is... Again, like top red, this is Caras Montana again, but this is one called Laterutia Sensu. This is a Japanese form. And you still see it's still quite variable, but the colouring is a little bit different, and the marking is a bit different on it. But it's not truly consistent yet, I believe. You can see the difference in here quite yeah. markedly. Yeah. This is an intergeneric hybrid. Uh, th th there's probably a few around, but I don't know all of them, but this is one. This is um, Lithops cross Dinteranthus. And uh, Dinteranthus is another mesem. And it looks like we might have a couple of pollinator seed heads on this one. Another really large group of mesems, which we'll try and do a bit of a talk on another day, are conophytums. And I'm fascinated by this group of plants. They're absolutely fabulous. And unfortunately, a bit of embarrassment here, a couple of weeds. But you know, look at this one, beautiful. And there's a lot of variation in this lot as well, oh, huge. just in... In fact, it's a bigger, wider, more varied group than lithops. Is this a conophytum? Yep, yeah. hyans. It's the smallest of them. That clump is many, many years old. I got it off a friend in Sydney, and that's a really, really old one. Several varieties of gibeon. These are little round things. They're really quite cute, and they get quite pale over summer. So it's sort of whitey looking. And this one? Vanudia. And all these actually, that's a funny name, Toby. That's a very Dutch name with the double E's. Vanudia. Edia. So this is Nananthus. Yep, another meso. And this one's a lovely one. This is a single generic species. There's only one species in this group called Lapidaria. They're really like a dry, a little bit hard to grow, but very white, you know perfectly I don't know, crossed over leaves. So this one's Argioderma. Argioderma. 30 eye. Sure. Yep. And we've got a couple, of sp a couple of different species of that one, but there's not a lot of them. But this one's a really round ball. And I think this is an unnamed Plesopilus, which I've got to figure out John, what you might like this one. They call this one bunny's ears. Um, now we've got a separate video on this one. Yeah, Monolaria. These are the yeah. seedlings we've got. Now these have gone past the new leaf stage when they look really cute, these little leaves standing up on end. But uh, yeah, that's the Monolaria. But these will get quite tall and the leaves will stand up straight. Yeah, as the season goes on. You can see the leaves elongating. 
They really, this should have a bit more water at this stage. It's a colourful looking little plant. Oh, it's beautiful. It's Brunzia and um, another Mesem. And so, really small, squat, little miniature shrub, really miniature shrub, but very, very colourful. And here's, this is the type of flower we have here. They're small daisy flowers close to the plant. This is a Mesem too. So this is Vicaria? Oh, yeah, Vicaria. Yeah, Tigerinia. Okay, so w this one, we've got white flowers and this we've is a got... white flowered form and there is a yellow flowered form. And then there's one of the special breeding over there from Japan, big red needles on it. And we've got some super warties, warty, unbelievably warty versions. So that's it for Lithops. Subscribe to the YouTube channel for regular updates on a whole range of succulents and indeed a whole range of garden plants. And as always, good luck with your gardening.